Hey guys, Katie Cleaver here and we're gonna talk top tips for new neuro nurses. So this is for those of you who are working in a neuro intensive care unit or a neuro floor or step down in a hospital. This is not outpatient information for those nurses working inpatient. All right, so let's go ahead and get into my top tips. So one of the most important things that you can do is learn the top disease processes that are landing patients in a neuro unit, okay? When you look up in a, in a neuro book or um, online, there are a lot of disease processes out there that um, affect patients neurologically. But there's like a plethora of them, but there's only a, like a certain amount of those that are really gonna justify somebody needing acute care and acute intensive care um, monitoring. And I want you to take your eyes and focus on those as opposed to everything, okay? Because while Alzheimer's is important and a very a disease process that so many patients have, that's not usually something that is going to put a patient in an ICU, okay? That's not that's not the main issue. But what might be is the fact that this patient who has a baseline of Alzheimer's has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I want you to understand a, a few specific disease processes inside and out wants you to be able to really understand truly what's going on in the brain and, and that will enable you to have really effective conversations with physicians, those neurosurgeons, neurointensivists, um, neurologists, and, and be able to speak to them on a level that, they're, that they are analyzing this patient at, okay? So that will help solidify the why behind what you're doing. It's not just giving the 3% saline, it's why are we giving the 3% saline, and, and when should I start to get concerned, and, and when do I need to let that physician know? And not just from the order parameters, but more from a big picture standpoint. So the disease processes I highly recommend you starting with. Don't end here, but this is where I want you to start. I want you to really understand ischemic stroke and not just ischemic stroke, but also those vessels in the circle of Willis that have the path of least resistance that are most likely to have a, a, an, an ischemic stroke occur within. Okay, I also want you to know subarachnoid hemorrhage. I want you to know intraventricular hemorrhage. I want you to know intracerebral hemorrhage, subdural hematoma, and hydrocephalus. I need you to have a really good understanding of those, okay? The caveat is, it's very difficult to read a sentence online, read a sentence in a book, and have that really make sense. These are very complex neurological disease processes. So. Give yourself a little grace. If you're, if you're trying to prepare for a role, I highly recommend you start here. Because if you can walk in with an understanding of these disease processes, that'll really put you ahead of the game. Because you can learn this stuff at home, but you can't learn some of the things that you need to learn, you know, at the hospital, at the hospital at home, right? So, um, encourage you to really understand those disease processes. I do have a course that walks you through them, and I have five minute videos of the uh, 3D videos of the brain and the ventricular system to show you exactly what's going on in the brain. Um, but you can also, you know, look around if you want online to try to find uh, things that are also helpful and speak to you as well. Um, I do have it all in one place if you if you want to check that out. And there's a link under this video to check out that course. Next, know your patient's sodium level. All right. So if you're if you've ever worked cardiac, you know all those cardiologists and those CV surgeons really want to know their patient's potassium level. Well, if we're in the neuro world, those neurologists, neurosurgeons, and neurointensivists really, really care about the patient's sodium level. The reason for this is, you know, if a patient is in the neuro ICU or in, in a neuro unit, they have some sort of neurological compromise. And a lot of them probably have increased intracranial pressure, okay? And we're trying to manage that. And when someone has a low sodium level, so our normal is 135 to 145, right? If someone has a low sodium level, what happens on a cellular level is cells begin to swell. So I think of that like, oh hell, the cell is swelling, right? Like that your cell is swelling. Well, when things swell, it gets bigger. So we have a patient who has neurological compromise, who has increased intracranial pressure, and now because of their electrolytes, their cells are swelling on top of that. And that can increase intracranial pressure even more. And we're in a position where we're trying to decrease it no matter, to decrease it so we don't have further ischemia, right? 
So that is why they really, really care about this, okay? Um, and it, it, it's also, you know, we can worry about it on the other end too, like the hypernatremia, the greater than 145. The thing is, as you might see in the neural world is us actually intentionally driving up the sodium level to, to get the cells to shrink. But there's a balance there. We can't go too high on that end because then they can shrink really rapidly. And that can also have a whole host of other complications as well that are very serious. You can actually have patients hemorrhage from that um, quick shift. Um, so that's really important to know. And also important to know um, trends as well. Because if a patient is chronically hyponatremic, like maybe they live at 130, and all of a sudden we they come into the hospital for whatever the issue is, maybe they have a sub Subdural hematoma, we see their 130. Oh man, we gotta give them, we gotta drive up that potassium or that sodium to be normal. Well, their brain, if they're if they're chronically like that, they're always like that. Their brain is used to it. And now we give them a bunch of sodium and and have the cells, you know, get bigger, or I'm sorry, shrink really fast, like that could cause a, another issue too. So trending is really important, not just knowing the one sodium right now but also the big picture next get a good baseline neuro assessment so what this looks like is you're getting report from that offgoing nurse and you're doing a brief bedside neuro check not the full all the whole thing but just so you're on the same page with their level of consciousness whatever existing deficits are there and the degree to which they're there so you know maybe they're weak on the right side but does that mean that they can pick their arm up does that mean they can grip does that mean that they can do a few things or they they can't move it at all right i need to understand the degree of that because you can't always gleam that from the chart and then if you don't do that let's say you don't look at the patient together and you go do your neuro assessment and wow, they really can't move their right arm. Um, is this new? I can't tell from that last nurse's chart. That was a night shift nurse. It is nine o'clock. I'm sure he or she is asleep. How am I going to know this? Do I need to, is this an emergency? Do I need to, you know, I can't tell you how much um, time and also probably some serious patient issues have been caught by doing that together. Okay. So highly encourage a very quick, um, neuro assessment together and then at the beginning of the shift you know after you um the report's gone or the, the last nurse is gone and you actually go in and do your first really good neuro assessment make sure you really are quantifying what you're seeing okay so it's not just their alert but you know can i um quantify their level of alertness their level of consciousness so like you know when i walk in a room and i say hey mr smith does he turn his head and like interact with me or is he sleeping and he wakes up or do I have to tap him on the arm? Do I have to shake his shoulder? Do I have to do, you know, a trap pinch? Like what do I have to get to wake this patient up, okay? And think about the amount of stimulation required to elicit that response. Because if it's been six hours later in the shift and you you feel like something's wrong, but you can't put your finger on it, mentally go back to that patient you assessed six hours ago and compare that amount of stimuli to get that response, compare that whatever issue change is to that patient you looked at six hours ago and ask yourself, is this the same patient? Did they make, as, are these changes massive compared to who I assessed earlier today? Because sometimes we really have to do that to get to understand exactly what's going on with the patient because we've been looking at them all day. We've been doing all these neural assessments. It's very easy to get used to the change and say, oh, well, they've been like that. Have they or have we lost objectivity, right? Because we're right here all the time. So um, questions I think that are very helpful to ask yourself is number one, how much stimulation does it require for me to get them to wake up and interact? Um, can they follow commands with their all four extremities readily? Okay, can they, can they quickly give me a thumbs up, you know, uh, or whatever, and move their fingers and wiggle their toes? Does it take a bit of coaxing? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Do, like quantifying the amount or, or how readily they utilize all four extremities. Um, do they fall asleep? My question number three, do they fall asleep while I'm talking to them? Um, can they maintain their level of alertness that I walked in the room to get them to wake up? Can they maintain that throughout this interaction? Or do I need to wake them back up or are they losing focus 
Um, those are the kind of questions you want to ask yourself. And one more is, are they truly oriented? While a patient can interact with you, do they really know what's going on or are they good just being within the context of this short interaction? We cannot wait for vital sign changes because those are incredibly late. All right, next. Find, um, ma or I'm sorry, make sure they really know their orientation questions. I have been fooled many times by a patient who seemed completely fine, and then you ask them directly what year it is, and they say 1942. Yeah, you're not oriented. You're very confused. It's very hard for me to appropriately monitor their neuro assessment if I don't actually have an accurate one. So it's important to you to ask very direct orient questions orientation questions even if it feels silly and I've seen people avoid this um, and I did myself a little bit because I just I feel so silly especially if the patient seems totally with it but I'm gonna give you a little talking point here so let's say the patient seems totally with it there and a lot of patients they want to downplay their injury they want to be better than they really are and I get that but I really need to know how your brain is doing, right? So this is not a time to like pretend you're doing better than you actually are. So here's my talking point. I'll say, all right, okay, humor me here. I'm gonna ask you some really, really important questions that may seem obvious, but your ability to answer them really tells me how your brain is doing in a way that these monitors um, and machines can't. And I'll point to like the bedside monitor and whatnot. Um, and then, then really look, this is this isn't anything about like I'm not grading you at all I'm just I need to know how you're doing and so I'm gonna come I'm gonna ask you these questions over and over again it's gonna seem silly but it's very very important for me to see how you're doing because these vital signs they only paint part of the picture um, so then what I'll do is then you know next time I go in I'll say pop quiz time or I'm gonna ask you my annoying questions I'm back you know um, and then and then go through asking them the questions and you switch it up they can cheat y'all those patients are sneaky all right they will um, memorize those answers obviously they have to give their name but can you ask them you know at the beginning I'll say hey can you tell me your name or sometimes if there's another person in the room, I'll say, who, who's in here with me? Or who's, who is this here? And have them explain who the people are and then ask them, all right, tell me your name again. Um, or you can ask, turn it into a yes, no. Is your name John? Is your name Barbara? Is your name whatever? And give them options. Um, then, you know, you can ask them what year it is, what month it is, what day it is. Although that one's kind of tough because you can lose sense of time even without a neurological injury when you're stuck in a hospital for a week or two. Um, ask him where they are right now. Do you know where you are and why Why are you here? Those situational questions. Um, and, and switch them up a little bit. You know, what holiday did we just celebrate? Um, are you at home right now? You know, giving them a, a yes or no. Are you at school? Are you at church? Are you at Popeye's chicken or whatever it is? Um, and see if they can appropriately answer. My last tip for you newbies into neuro is to practice describing neuro changes to your preceptor. Again, this might sound silly, but it's incredibly necessary because neuro is unlike cardiac, um, renal, other things where it's a little more straightforward and, and reliant upon numbers and vital signs and hemodynamics. Now, while those do play a part, the way we really know that someone is changing neurologically is by what's going on in their brain. And Often the physicians are not near us and at the bedside and they're relying on our ability to articulate what we see to make medical decisions. So highly encourage you to practice saying things, describing what you're seeing in front of you um, in a way that enables that, that physician to make the best possible decision um, based off of what you're telling them, okay? Um, so if you like these tips, if you found this helpful, please comment, subscribe. Um, I've got links to other neuro-related uh, resources as well as a little, uh, little email course that you can check out as well. So thanks, guys.